some point in your career, you're going to come across a pregnant lady. Some of us more often than not. Some of us work with pregnant people every day. The question you need to ask yourself is, can you describe the physiological changes associated with pregnancy and how they affect your day-to-day -day practice? When considering this, you're best using a systems approach, so we'll start with haematology. The first thing to note here is there is an increased plasma volume, and this increases preload given to the heart and the volume of distribution of polar drugs. It's increased by about 50% at term. There's also an increase in red blood cell mass, but because the plasma volume increases more than the red blood cells, this causes a physiological anemia or a dilutional anemia. The levels of white blood cells increase during pregnancy and particularly during labour. They're usually at a level of 12 by term, with a further increase to 30 during labour. You will see a decreased platelet level and this is due to consumption in the body. Your albumin also decreases and this increases the free active proportion of plasma bound drugs in the body, which is very important when you're considering what drugs you're giving somebody. You'll also see a decrease in plasma oncotic pressure. This increases the risk of edema. The plasma cholinesterase levels reduce in the body, and you might think that this might affect drugs like succinamethonium, but it actually doesn't really because this is offset by the increase in volume of distribution due to the increased plasma volume as we've discussed earlier. You can also expect to see a CRP and ESR rise in pregnant ladies. However, one of the most important haematological changes that occur during pregnancy is the fact that the woman is hypercoagulable. All of her clotting factors will increase except factor 11 and factor 13. You'll see a PT and APTT shortening but there's a high risk of thromboembolic complications and VTE prophylaxis must be considered in these ladies in hospital. Let's move on to the cardiovascular system. Systemic vascular resistance is reduced in pregnant lady and there's a reduction in diastolic blood pressure more than systolic blood pressure and this leads to an increased pulse pressure in pregnant ladies. This is due to estrogen and mostly progesterone. Progesterone gets blamed for everything during pregnancy. However, maintenance of the systemic vascular resistance is governed by sympathetic drive, and that's diminished by central neuraxial blockade like spinal anaesthetics. You'll also see an increased stroke volume and heart rate increase in pregnant ladies. Cardiac output increases to up to about 50 to 60% at term, which is about 8 litres a minute. There's an increase in the mass of the left ventricle, and ECGs will show left axis deviation, and sometimes T wave changes like a flat or inverted shape. A systolic murmur is nearly universal at term, but you must always remember that diastolic murmur is not normal. Another really important fact about pregnant ladies is that their gravid uterus causes vena cable compression, which is why they find it hard lying supine. This reduces venous return and preload to the heart. This therefore decreases cardiac output as per Starling's law. All of this manifests as a decreased blood pressure and engorged vertebral veins. You can alleviate vena caval and aortic compression by using a left lateral tilt. So that brings us on to aortic compression. You'll see this at about 20 weeks gestation when the woman is lying supine. This decreases cardiac output and placental blood flow. If you're using left lateral tilt, it should be at least 15 degrees. This can be achieved with an operating table or using pillows. Capillary enlargement and mucosal congestion in the respiratory system leads to voice changes and difficulty breathing in some women. The diaphragm is elevated by about 4 centimetres due to the gravid uterus. The ribs and therefore chest wall are splayed outwards and this causes diaphragmatic breathing by turn. In terms of lung volumes, the functional residual capacity is reduced by up to 20% and the closing volume nears the FRC. This leads to airway closures in the lungs and increases the risk of hypoxia. This is made worse if you lie the patient supine, like if they're going to undergo a C-section, or if they're obese, or they've got multiple pregnancy. The tidal volumes are increased, but the total lung capacity and the vital capacity remain the same. You'll also see an increase in respiratory rate and minute volume, and bronchodilation leads to an increase in dead space. In terms of ABGs, you'll see an alkalotic picture of about 7.5 pH, a PO2 of 14 as oxygen increases in the blood, and a decrease in PO2 due to hyperventilation at about 3.5, and the bicarb will reduce to about 18. And an extremely important concept to get your head around is that oxygen consumption increases by up to about 60% by term. This increases the risk of developing hypoxia during the induction of anaesthesia. In the gastrointestinal system, you get a lower esophageal sphincter tone due to progesterone, the barrier pressure reduces due to an increased intragastric pressure due to the gravid uterus. Gastric emptying itself is reduced and this occurs during labour due to the effects of pain and giving patients opioids like diamorphine. The risk of aspiration increases and this returns to normal levels about 48 hours postpartum. So renal blood flow and glomerular filtration rate increase in pregnancy by up to 50%. Urea and creatinine levels they reduce, meaning that a normal creatinine level in pregnancy is abnormal. Glycosuria and proteinuria are common. Lastly, let's look at the effects on the central nervous system. The epidural space reduces in size due to the engorged extradural venous plexus. 
CSF volume is also reduced and that's why we use reduced volumes of local anaesthetic agents during neuroaxial blockade. Importantly, pregnancy decreases your minimum alveolar concentration of gases required to achieve anaesthesia and that inhalational induction is faster and this is probably due to an increase in minute volume rather than the increase in cardiac output. And post labour, it's also important to remember, for about four hours the lady has reduced respiratory muscle strength. In the endocrine system, the thyroid will increase its production of T3 and T4, which may suppress TSH. Insulin secretion is increased during pregnancy, but so are anti-insulin hormones like cortisol. Depending on the interplay between such hormones, this can cause gestational diabetes in pregnant ladies.